We are back in the book of Revelation. And so turn to Revelation chapter 12. That will be the text we will be looking at this morning. And I'm going to pray for us as we get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. What a joy it is to gather with your people. What a joy it is to sing songs like we have sung about a battle that we are in and armor that we need to wear and yet your victory that you reign. You are the absolute sovereign over all things. And we recognize now this world does not recognize your sovereignty. It is not obvious and physical on this earth as it will be one day. But you are our king and You have purchased a loyalty to yourself, to your own glory, to your own purposes, in our affections, in our hearts, by the gospel of your son. And even more than making us your loyal subjects, you have made us sons and daughters and inheritors of eternity. Things too high for us, things too good for us, and yet true. We bank on these realities. We're thankful for your revelation of the future the history of this world because you are the sovereign over that history and you have pre-written it and we entrust ourselves to you. God, we ask as we look at your word this morning that you by your Holy Spirit would help us to be soft-hearted with open eyes, with an eager ear, with a life ready to be laid before you in obedience and faith that you would give to us all the appropriate points of interest and application for our own lives. May we live differently, having sat under your word together as a church. And we ask it in your glorious name. Amen. The world is not as it seems. We get accustomed to the things that we can perceive with our senses. We start to think we know how the world operates. We have our routines for work and school and recreation. We go about our business and we implicitly trust that everything will reliably truck on. The stores will be open and stocked with provisions that we need and with the luxuries we enjoy. Our appliances will clean our clothes and our dishes. Amazon will deliver just about anything we want this afternoon. But the world is not as it seems. There are dark forces at work in the world. Conspirators who pull the levers of human society, ushering all of us mind-numbed robots toward a new world order. I don't know about you, but I am easily entertained by a good conspiracy theory. Perhaps you are. A conspiracy theory is an unprovable assertion about some malevolent cabal, some evil group of power brokers seeking to manipulate society for their own gain. And a good conspiracy theory has enough intriguing data points to lead us to a conclusion without definite proof, but with some sort of explanation for every counterfact. If you deny the conspiracy, you must be in on it. You may believe that we're all part of a giant computer simulation. Perhaps you believe that the lunar landings were conducted in a Hollywood studio. Maybe you believe there are spaceships stored at Area 51. Or that the U.S. government is contracting commercial airliners to drop mind control chemicals on the populace. That NASA has a monopoly on the world's helium supply on a base in Antarctica. And that the International Space Station is actually a helium balloon tethered to the Antarctic continent. That the idea of a globe-shaped earth, rather than the reality of a flat earth, is a giant cover-up for all their evil schemes. Well, you shouldn't believe any of those ones. In fact, if you believe in chemtrails, I have some new videos I took this week I'd like to show you. Perhaps you believe the CIA was responsible for the JFK assassination, or that Chinese spies have infiltrated vast swaths of our government and industry, that big tech companies are the new ruling oligarchy behind all the world's governments, or that George Soros and now his son are the real operators pulling all the levers of societal control. I don't know about those ones. But there is an active, malevolent conspiracy in our world today which is far darker, far deeper, far broader, and infinitely more consequential 
than all those other conspiracy theories and actual conspiracies put together. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, reveals this. Our gospel, that life-changing truth of God's love for sinners that has changed us, our gospel, says Paul, is veiled, hidden. It's hidden by a malevolent cabal of conspirators. Listen to how Paul describes it. It's veiled to those who are perishing. Don't you want the perishing to know the good news that we know? They're blinded. Paul describes it in verse 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And the English translators of the Bible have rightly put that first word for God in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 as a lowercase g. Not speaking about the one true God, but an imitator, a phony, a one who is parading about as a God, and it is none other than Satan. He is, he is the one pulling the levers behind the scenes, concocting this malevolent conspiracy against God and against humanity. And according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, the result is a blinding towards the gospel for all of humanity. Why don't people just hear the gospel when you explain it, agree that it's good news, believe and be saved? Because there is a worldwide deception at play behind the scenes. And as we go back to Revelation this morning, we're going to see this great cosmic conspiracy. It is an invisible battle that has shaped history as long as man has been on the earth. This is a 6,000 year old conspiracy and it is no theory. Every one of us has been in on it. Every one of us has been duped by it. Every one of us has participated in it actively. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, you have been rescued from it. How did that rescue happen? Same text, 2 Corinthians 4, two verses later in verse 6. God, the one true God, the creator and sustainer of the universe who said, light shall shine out of darkness. Do you remember when God did that? Back in Genesis, first page of your Bible, there was only darkness and God commanded light to be. Literally, the Hebrew text says, light be. And the light that did not exist obeyed the very command of God by coming into existence and lighting up the universe. The God with that kind of creative power has redemptive purpose. God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You were born into the conspiracy. You were blinded by Satan. You were part of the system and light pierced your darkness, Christian. The light of the gospel invaded your life. And now as a follower of Jesus Christ, you've switched sides. You are now an enemy of that global conspiracy and your job is to rescue others from it. Remember what this battle is. This battle is not about politics It's not about guns and swords. It's not about famines and world crises primarily. It's not about the physical things that you and I could perceive. It's it's not a battle for morals on television. Paul says in Ephesians 6, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It is against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. Ours is a battle against invisible, wicked, conspiratorial forces with malignant purpose. Purpose against God and against humanity. Scott Demarest just took us through the book of Zechariah over this summer. I want to thank Scott for that. And in my view, the book of Zechariah is the most challenging book in the Bible. And through your hard work, Scott, you helped us understand it. Thankful also for the break that it gave me for some rest and time away and opportunity to work on some other things. But in listening to the book of Zechariah explained, there were significant takeaways for me. 
to see how all of the Bible holds together in a verse by verse exposition of Zechariah. And then Eric took us through Psalm two, right in that time. And here we are in the book of revelation. And just recently having covered Daniel, all of these things go together. And the more you look at the details, the more you realize the seamless nature of this book. We read it goes together. And, and the more you look at the pixels in the picture down to the fine details and then zoom out and look at the big picture and then zoom back in and look at the pixels, it all holds together. And these kinds of things are an apologetic for the Bible itself. In other words, the Bible proves its own truthfulness over the thousands of years it was constructed through the vehicle of human instrumentation. It was superintended by God through the Holy Spirit to be one book with one message. I almost put up a two. One message. Old Testament, New Testament, history, prophecy, poetry, all of it working together. A really remarkable testimony to the word of God. It's truthfulness down to the very details. And listen, if, if we can understand a book as enigmatic as Zechariah, that gives us hope that if we put our heads down, do the spade work and study the scriptures for ourselves, we can understand any of it. Another takeaway is just seeing there in Zechariah, God's promises to Israel. When you think about the way your Bible is constructed, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, 2000 years of human history went by until you have the nation of Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the nation is preserved in Egypt and then constituted under Moses with the giving of the law. And the giving of the law concludes before the people go into the land with the book of Deuteronomy. It's Moses' sermon finishing out the first five books. And he's preaching to the people that they need to be faithful to Yahweh as they go into the land. And it comes with the blessings and curses, the, the promises and the warnings of chapters 28 and 29. And you'll remember there that the gospel, the new covenant, the promise of someone better than Moses coming, Jesus, new birth, heart circumcision, it's all there in the beginning. And it's given to Israel as a nation, the people who would hold the oracles of God as a stewardship and then give birth to Messiah as a nation. They had God's very word. And that word came with the warnings. If you follow me, you believe me, I will bless you. I will put you in the land. I will give you new hearts. I will give you rest. And best of all, I will be your God and you will be my people. That is the overarching promise of the whole Bible. Right there at the beginning. And when, as you think forward through your old Testament, you, you come to the prophets and the things that the prophets say, hearken back to what Moses preached at the end of Deuteronomy. You forgot the Lord. You didn't remember to keep his commandments. And so this thing that I said would happen, the warnings that I gave you that, that other nations would come in and plunder and burn your city to the ground and scatter you throughout the, all the nations. It has happened. And the prophets looking back at Deuteronomy and staring at the people in their own day are saying exactly what God said would happen have happened. And that's not the end of the story. Because that prophet greater than Moses would come, the one Moses said, listen to him, is still in the future from the prophet's day. And his coming and suffering as a substitute sacrifice was still future. And his coming as a reigning king with dominion over the whole earth and all the nations from Jerusalem is still coming. And so Zechariah and the rest of the prophets set up the Old Testament with this tension where we just say, when? How long, O Lord? And the world is left in this tension. And as we see Zechariah, for instance, bring out for us the fulfillments of that first coming down to the details. We recognize that the coming of Messiah in his second coming will also be fulfilled down to the details. And this is so critical for us. You see, Israel's faithlessness did not change God's faithfulness. It did not undo his promises. Zechariah showed us that revelation shows us that turn to Romans chapter nine. I want you to see why this matters. I 
Let every man be a liar. God will be true. When God promised Moses, here's the promises, here's the blessings for obedience, here's the curses and warnings for disobedience, and you will disobey, and I will punish you, and you will be scattered, God also says, but... I will regather you. I will sprinkle you with clean water. I will give you new hearts and you will obey and I will bless. All of it comes to pass. Look at Romans 9, 6. Paul is describing as an Israelite who has believed the gospel, his sorrow for the nation of Israel who rejected Messiah. In verse 9, 6, he says, it is not as though the word of God has failed, You and I reading that would would never say God's word drops to the ground, having not come to its intended end, and it just falls apart. Why does Paul say it here? Because as he testifies in the first five verses of chapter 9, and testifies again in the first few verses of chapter 10, Israel is in a state of unbelief in Paul's day. And it doesn't seem like the Deuteronomic blessings have come to pass. It doesn't seem like Israel's Messiah is bringing them rest and the land and a people and a blessing and a blessing to all the nations. What of the Genesis 3.15 promise to the woman? What of the Genesis 12 promise to Abraham and then to Isaac and to Jacob? What of the 2 Samuel 7 promise to David of a king reigning from Jerusalem over the nations? When? Where? It seems like the word of God is falling apart. And then Paul spends three chapters in Romans explaining why the word of God is not failing, even though Israel in Paul's day is in unbelief. And of course, he gives three answers to that question. Not everybody that's a Jew is a believer, first of all. Let's just start there. Throughout Israel's history, you've had unbelieving Israelites. Not all Israel is Israel. Additionally, God is faithful to preserve a remnant. Elijah thought he was alone. God said, you're not alone. I have preserved for myself thousands who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And of course, there's a remnant in Paul's day of Jews who actually did believe in Messiah. Like Paul. And all the apostles. And then, the third reason, down in chapter 11, is that a day is coming, and this is what Scott was taking us through in Zechariah, when all Israel will be saved. Verse 26. Romans 11, there's a generation of Israelites coming where nationally, entirely, they will repent and believe Messiah. Zechariah 12, 10, they will look on Yahweh whom they pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. This was the result of the Holy Spirit being poured out in grace and supplication. Paul says here in Romans eleven twenty six, 26, the deliverer will come from Zion. He'll remove uncleanliness from Jacob. That's a code word for Israel. This is my covenant with them, Israel, when I take away their sins. And then he goes on to make it even more explicit in verse 28. From the standpoint of the gospel, they, unbelieving Israel, are enemies of the gospel for believers' sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice or election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Why? Because the gift and calling of God are irrevocable. Cannot be changed. Why is this in the book of Romans? A letter describing the the gospel of Jesus Christ to mostly Gentiles. Well, because God makes really big promises to us Gentiles who are writing the coattails of Israel's promises. Remember Romans 8? No separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, we'll go to those promises if God can go back on his word. If I can stumble and fall and fail, and does that negate God's promises? Or will God be faithful to what he said? And that's the answer. That, that's why the excursus on Israel in Romans 9 to 11, it is about God's integrity at keeping his promises. It is about God's reputation as a promise maker and promise keeper. And Christian, you need to know, Israel has been around for 4,000 years as a distinct people. And God has a future. And that has everything to do with you. Because God keeps his promises. And he has made promises to you in the gospel as a Gentile. And for any of you that are Jewish in this room, double blessings. (laughs) 
Nearly a third of your Bible is eschatology. You thought about that? Why, why would God spend a third of this book talking about prophecy and future things and end times? And I mean, if, if you think about it, most of the world has not lived in the end times. In fact, perhaps none of the world presently existing has ever lived in the end times and never will. Or maybe we're close. Some generation someday is going to live in the end times. Why would, give, why would God give all of this information about the distant future? And you need to remember that eschatology in the Bible drives ethical living. There's always a purpose associated with thinking about the future. I want to give you just a few, just to remind us as we're getting back into the book of Revelation, that eschatology motivates holy living. Because there is a final accounting, thinking about the end, when Jesus will sit on the, the throne of rewards for believers or the sheep and goats judgment in Matthew 25 to assess the lives of tribulation saints or to uh, sit on his glorious throne, the white judgment throne and, and judge the dead from all time. There is a final accounting of life. And the New Testament doctrine of the imminent return of Christ, Jesus could come back for his people at any time and we don't know when it is. That is a purifying doctrine. Jesus himself uses it in Luke 12. You don't know when the master is going to return. Could be in the morning, could be in the night. So live a certain way. With the right clothes on, doing the right activities. You don't want to be found doing the wrong things when Jesus returns. That is a holy motivation for holy living. Secondly, eschatology teaches us to relinquish our grip on a world scheduled for demolition. You read the, the eschatological portions of the Bible and you realize this world won't last long. It's not permanent. And it is under the threat of judgment. If you've ever done a home renovation, you understand this. If you're going to rip out the kitchen cabinets, if you're going to take up the floors and put down new flooring next week, it's not likely you're painting the baseboards this week. Listen, it just changes life. It, it changes priorities when we have a, a real sense of the imminent return of Christ and of a final accountability for all of humanity. Thirdly, eschatology exposes our loyalties. What are you living for? What do you love? Do you have all your eggs in the basket of this temporal existence? Have you doubled down on this life? Carpe diem. Seize the day. I read a sweatshirt this week that said, I seized the wrong day. <laughs> and to put all your eggs in the basket of this life is to totally miss everything. Eschatology exposes our loyalties, brings to the surface those things we're living for. It brings to the, the front of our mind a, a temporal view of life. Eschatology also promotes urgency in living. Listen, there's an urgency to the way you live. You realize that life is short. Hell is real. Heaven is your home, Christian. So this is temporary. This is camping. And it goes by like that. It promotes an urgency in our evangelism. You see the sea of people around us. Cut through the fear, cut through the awkwardness, start conversations about Jesus. You'll wish you had. Thinking about the future helps you do it. It promotes an urgency in our parenting. Listen, you think about people out there differently, you think about people in your home differently. Listen, I know it's hard when you got little ones. And it seems like the same routine over and over again, trying to help them learn some new thing, obey this. And they just don't listen. When will they be old enough to understand the gospel realities that will shape their temper tantrums? Yeah. Stick with it. It matters. Your instruction, your discipline, your consistent love matters. And I think eschatology fuels parenting. You think about eternity, you think about an accountability, you think about the end, the shortness of life and how critical it is to pour into our kids when they're young. 
Listen, in all of it, you just think about people differently. C.S. Lewis said, you've never met a mere mortal. You've never met someone whose existence stops at their funeral. Everybody lives forever. There's a kind of living forever that's called death. But it's not an ending. We need to think about people through the lens of eschatology. And then eschatology also encourages investment in eternal things. You think about missions. Think about the church. You think about investment of time and resources and the things that will last. I'm reading a book right now on the history of pepper, the world's most influential spice. It's fascinating. During the era of exploration, and I want you to think about pepper differently every time you you use it. (laughs) During the age of exploration, entire nations built navies to go get spices from places like Sumatra, India, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea. With the technology, the navies around it, the, the pirate ships sinking other ships, trying to get a crate of pepper that was worth a crate of gold at some points. Uh, pepper was traded as a commodity, inherited as an inheritance. You could pay wages by pepper. This just tells you how bad the food was in England. <laughs> And we scoured the globe looking for pepper to make our food taste better. We went to the the farthest reaches and the ends of the earth. And listen, today we are still trying to go to the ends of the earth 500 years later because the gospel hasn't been taken to all the nooks and crannies. Oh, we went to all the nooks and crannies to get slaves, to get ivory, to, to rape the land of all of its resources and to make our food taste better. But we haven't finished with the gospel Can we put our resources toward the things that last forever? Eschatology drives it. I was talking to Rick Holland last week. Many of you know him. He's a friend of this church. And many of you sermon stalk him. He said he is preparing to preach Daniel and Revelation and Zechariah and Matthew 24 and 25. And he was paraphrasing one scholar he'd been reading. He said, there's only one application for all of it. Jesus is returning soon and he's really angry. And of course, there are many applications that flow out of that for our lives. But listen, that is a sobering reality. We just need to cement in our hearts. So let's turn back to Revelation chapter 12. And let's read the first six verses. Here's what God says through the apostle John. I was about to read Romans 12. (laughs) Didn't seem right. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child and she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail sweeps away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that she would be nourished for 1,260 days. What we have in Revelation 12 is a break in the action. The chronology of the storyline of Revelation is interrupted here. In fact, the storyline doesn't pick up again until Revelation 15, 5. Look back at chapter 11, beginning in verse 15. We read there the seventh angel sounding. And you remember there were seven seal judgments and the the last seal broken revealed seven trumpet judgments. And the last trumpet blown by an angel is going to reveal seven more judgments. We are between now sixth and seventh trumpet judgment. 
And we read in 1115, the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And you feel when the seventh trumpet blares that everything's accelerating and we are right near the end. And the 24 elders, verse 16, who sit on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and they worship God, saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and you have begun to reign and the nations were enraged and your rage came and the time came for the dead to be judged and to give reward to your slaves, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. This is the end is near. Verse 19, and the sanctuary of God, which is in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant appeared in the sanctuary and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. And you get this scene, the, the seventh trumpet sounds, all of heaven knows it's about to go down. Seven more judgments are coming in rapid fire succession. The earth is going to be obliterated. And heaven is really angry. Rumblings, fire, storm, hail. The Ark of the Covenant is there. And all of heaven is just anticipating the last judgments that are coming. And then chapter 12, and there was a great sign in heaven. It's kind of a meanwhile back at the ranch. <laughs> Wait a second. What's, what's the next thing that's going to happen? I want to know what happens when the seventh trumpet sounds. Well, you have to turn to Revelation 15 and verse 5. There, the chronology picks up from 1119. And John writes, after these things, that is after the subplot of chapters 12, 13, and 14, after these things I looked, and the sanctuary of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. There you get the repeat of the end of chapter 11. The heaven was opened, there's the tabernacle, same thing. And the seven angels who have the seven plagues came out of the sanctuary, clothed in linen, and then you get the unfolding of these seven bowl judgments, the seven vile judgments, which are the implementation of that last trumpet judgment. So the trumpet sounds, three chapters of subplot, and then the chronology picks back up in chapter 15. You might put a, a note in your margin there at the end of chapter 11 that the chronology picks up back in 15.5. It's one way to sort of keep track of what's happening in Revelation what we have here in Revelation 12 to 14, in between, in between the blowing of the seventh trumpet and then the results of that seventh trumpet, is a subplot, a backstory. It's a flashback and a flash forward. It's the big picture. And the scenes portrayed here encompass nearly the entirety of human history on this planet. These three chapters give us a window into the cosmic warfare that has already been raging for nearly six millennia. It is a battle that has been almost entirely invisible to us, and yet it is the conflict behind all other conflicts. The remainder of the book of Revelation closes out history. Chapters 15 to 19 will give us the details of the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, that period that Jesus called the Great Tribulation. And then from chapter 15, the book of Revelation accelerates through that seventh trumpet judgment, the last one, which unleashes the final seven rapid fire bowl judgments. And then there will be new characters on the scene during that time. During the time of the great tribulation, the last three and a half years, we will be introduced to the Antichrist, the false prophet, a remnant believing population of humans, and a worldwide false religion. And so what we have here in 12 through 14, and, and here's the main idea. Sorry, all of that was introduction. Here's the main idea of this passage is a narrative interruption that provides the backstory on three significant players in the end of the world drama known as the Great Tribulation. That's a mouthful. That could be like a Puritan sermon title. A narrative interruption that provides the backstory on three significant players in the end of the world drama known as the Great Tribulation. The outline's much easier than the main thesis statement. The outline is simply this. Israel, Satan, Jesus. We're going to get the backstory on these three characters. We'll get a more backstory on the other characters later in this subplot. I want to locate ourselves 
So on the screen, I have a, a chart. And uh, I don't know if you can see that, but on the, on the far left, you have the cross. That is a depiction of Christ's first coming. And then a, a red arrow straight up. That is his ascension after the resurrection. The church age follows. There's a you are here sign with an arrow pointing. Uh, so today, uh, August 11th, 2024, you are here. There's a gap with a question mark. That means nobody knows the day or the hour and run away from anybody who tells you they know when Jesus is coming back for the church. So we don't know. But at some point in the future, Jesus will return not to the earth, but to meet us in the air. That's the red sort of harpoon looking thing, which comes from the Greek word harpazo, which is the word for rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. That depicts the rapture. Two blue lines, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then those who are alive and remain when he returns, will meet him in the air and we will be with him always. And sometime after that, whether it's immediate or months later, or we don't have a time frame, but sometime after that, the seven year period of tribulation begins and coming down from heaven, you have three series of judgments, the kind of little red arrows coming down from heaven, the Trumpet ju- or the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and then the bowl judgments. And notice the trumpet judgments overlap the middle section of the tribulation. That's an attempt to depict that probably the abomination of desolation, the midpoint, that is when the Antichrist stands up in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, declares himself to be God, and demands worldwide worship. The peace treaty with Israel will be broken. And now it's all out war of all the nations against Israel happens right in the middle. That the trumpet judgments probably overlap that, that you have the seventh trumpet unfolding in the second half of the tribulation or the great tribulation. Of course, all of this end times thing biblically is called the day of the Lord, but the great and terrible day of the Lord is that one moment in Revelation 19 at the end of the tribulation, the red arrow comes back down, blue arrows come back down with it. That's Revelation 19, the rider on the white horse coming down with the saints dressed in fine linen. That's us. Jesus comes down and he smites the beast and the false prophet, the Antichrist and his right hand guy, tosses them alive into the lake of fire refurbishes the earth over a period of, of, of days that Daniel describes. Blessed are those who make it to the 1,335 days. And then sits on the throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years of the best era of human history. And we with him. That will terminate in a final rebellion and then the demolition of the present heavens, present earth, and then the installation of a new heavens and new earth forever and ever and ever. So to locate ourselves here where the blue arrow, you are here, 2024, hearing about what John describes in Revelation chapter 12, which locates us right about the midpoint of the tribulation, perhaps just after. But the the subplot here takes us back and forward to all of human history, to this cosmic war. And there will be a number of new players that John's going to introduce us to so that we understand what's happening in the Great Tribulation. And the first three players in that cosmic war are what we see in our text this morning. Israel, Satan, and the church. Let's talk about Israel first. First two verses. John writes, And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, on her head a crown of twelve stars, and she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain, to give birth. Notice this is a great sign. This is the first of seven signs coming in the remainder of the book of Revelation. A sign is a pointer. A sign is not the thing. The sign points to a thing. This is a symbol. A symbol. And it's a symbol with a reality behind it. It is a symbol explained. And this is important for us to understand. The book of Revelation has symbols in it. That does not mean that you take everything in the book of Revelation as a symbol. We are to take the things as symbols that are called symbols. In fact, the the fact that this is called a symbol and then it is explained, 
that there is a real, literal, historical, future historical reality behind the symbol indicates to us that the other things that are not called symbols ought to be taken at face value. Some interpreters of the book of Revelation see, say, aha, there's a symbol. Therefore, everything's a symbol. Take nothing literally. <laughs> that is not the approach that we would take. I don't think that's warranted. I think the, the text gives us a symbol, tells us what it is, and describes other things in plain language to be taken normally. This woman is not an actual woman. She is a symbol of something else. She is called a great sign. There are other women who serve as symbols in the book of Revelation. The harlot in Revelation 17 is a symbol of an apostate world religion. And then there is another woman in Revelation 19 called the wife of the lamb. She is the symbol of the true church. A woman here in Revelation 12 is a symbol for a mass of people. And across generations, here the woman represents the nation of Israel. And we see her identified in these two verses. Notice in verse 1, she is a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. And I can't tell you how much ink and paper have been wasted trying to determine what a woman clothed with the sun must represent. Because the sun is glorious and luminous and people go into all this astronomy about sun and moon and stars and what they represent in pagan mythology and so attached to this woman, blah, blah, blah. I think it is um, fairly obvious from Genesis 37, 9, what this woman represents. Listen to Joseph's dream. He related to his brothers and he said, I've had a dream and behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. How did Joseph take this dream? How did Joseph's dad take this dream? Uh, exactly as God intended it. Jacob is the sun. Rachel is the moon. The 11 stars in Joseph's dream were his brothers. So together with the 11, Joseph makes 12 those 12 stars, the 12 sons of Jacob, who was renamed Israel. These are the 12 tribes of Israel. All of this represents the nation and God's covenant promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, AKA Israel, and the specific promises he made to his descendants. This woman is the nation. And look at verse two. And she was with child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. This clarifies for us, where did Messiah come from? Messiah came from Israel. The she here, this metaphor, this symbol is the nation. Depicted here as bringing forth a child and being in torment leading up to his birth. Israel was the woman who brought forth Messiah in keeping with Genesis 3.15. You remember that in Genesis 3.15, God promised Eve, the very first woman, that she would have a seed that would crush the head of the snake. And as you're reading your biblical chronology, you're looking for who is that seed of the woman who will crush the snake? And perhaps Eve assumed it was Cain. Cain was a grievous disappointment. Cain murdered his brother. So you know it's not Cain and you know it's not Abel. Okay, who's it going to be? Seth. She even names Seth with the faith in God of a promised seed. Maybe it'll be Seth. Nope, it's not Seth. It's not any of the descendants in the genealogies. The genealogies become very important. And it's not until you get to Genesis 12 that you have promise reinstated that from Abram, a pagan idolater, God is going to make a nation, a people for a land and blessing who will be a blessing to all the nations. And you have God instating this promise through the, the genetic funnel of Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob and then in Genesis 49 through the tribe of Judah and then in 2 Samuel 7 through the line of David. And the Old Testament waits for this one. And this woman, Israel, the nation, in, in labor and turmoil and travail until Messiah would come is the picture here. The Roman Catholic Church has said this is Mary. Mary's the, the one who gives birth to Messiah. And, and that's true metaphoric or uh, historically. Um, this sign, this metaphor, this symbol of a woman can't point to Mary because in this very same chapter, in the last half of the tribulation, this woman is persecuted on the earth, flees Jerusalem, and is chased around by the Antichrist and by Satan. Uh, that's not true of Mary. It is true of the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel was afflicted severely at the first advent of Christ. 
Uh, The first coming of Messiah. Uh, Satanic hostility surrounded his arrival. And then the arrival of Messiah the second time will also be marked by satanic hostility against the woman, against the son, and against all of the seed of God's people. Scott took us through that in Zechariah 13. Turn back there for just a moment as a reminder. No other nation has faced the travail, the turmoil, the the persecution, the genocidal intentions as has the nation of Israel. And this shouldn't be any surprise. These are the kinds of things God promised when Israel was constituted back in the wilderness before they even entered the land the first time. But at the second coming of Messiah leading up to that, We studied in Zechariah 13, verse 8. It will be in all the land, declares Yahweh, that two parts in it will be cut off and breathe their last, and the third will be left. I will bring the third part through fire, refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say they're my people, and I'm their God. Trouble, travail, difficulty, murder, genocidal intentions, two-thirds cut off and killed in unbelief. But the third that remains as a nation in chorus, singing the song of Zechariah 12.10, they will look on Yahweh whom they pierced and mourn in repentance, singing the song of Isaiah 53. It was our transgressions that he bore. He was wounded for our sins. We didn't believe it. We thought he was cursed of God. They will sing those songs. This echoes Daniel's description Of the 70th week, that that 70th group of sevens. Remember that that weeks in Daniel 9 is just the word for sevens. It's not a a period of seven days as we know, but just a grouping of seven. And here, groupings of seven years. Listen to Daniel 9, 24. Seventy sevens have been determined for your people. For whom? For Israel. And for your holy city, that is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. To finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the Holy of Holies. So you have a lot of things that have to happen specific to Israel. You are to know and have insight that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Add them together, you get 69 sevens or 69 groupings of seven years. And all of that leads down to the very day of Messiah's first coming to his triumphal entry in Jerusalem. Then after those 69 sevens, Messiah will be cut off, verse 26, that is killed. He will have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come, that is a reference to the Roman Empire, the the Romans. They will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And it will come with a flood. In the end, there will be war and desolations. And then in verse 27, he will make a firm covenant with the many for one seven. That is a a final seven. There will be a a Roman Empire treaty. And in the middle of that seven, middle of seven is three and a half. That's the period we're talking about here in Revelation 12 and following. He, that is the one who makes the treaty with Israel, the Antichrist, the representative of the Roman Empire. He will make sacrifice and grain offerings cease. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So here Daniel tells us, the man is coming who will make an agreement with Israel for seven years, break the agreement halfway through it, three and a half, stand in a rebuilt temple, and then God's going to destroy him. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation, let the reader of Daniel understand Run away, flee. That's depicted here in verse 6, which we will get to next week. All of this description of Israel is important for us. Israel's history is 4,000 years old on this earth. The career of this first significant player 
in the great tribulation is this nation who for all of our lifetimes have been in unbelief, having rejected Messiah, having crucified Messiah and not repented except for a few scattered remnant believers who happen to be Jews. Remember that Israel is not blessed today or, or protected today because she's faithful to Yahweh. She merely exists because God will not let her go out of existence because God will bring her to repentance nationally. God will keep his promises. We won't take the time this morning to go into these next two players. We'll do that next week, Lord willing. But we are scheduled this morning to close with a hymn, Martin Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And when I was in college, in Bible college, I remember singing this hymn and stopping in the middle of the second verse. I remember being struck by it. I, I had been a Lutheran for three years, and it's a good hymn. Lutherans sing it, and, and we should sing it. But I, I remember being struck by perhaps paying attention to the words for the first time. Two verses in, realizing, wait, I've just sung an anthem to Satan for like two whole verses. I'm not singing this anymore. Until you get to the Bud Jesus part. And so we haven't talked about Satan and his work during the Great Tribulation yet. We'll have to postpone that till next week. We haven't talked about Satan's 6,000 year long career of malevolence and murder of humanity. We'll get to that next week. But we are going to, as a preview, sing about how awful Satan is and how defeated he already is because of Christ. So I'll close in prayer and the musicians will come up and lead us in that great hymn. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the truth of your word that you have secured already every detail of the future. That you have pre-written history, that it cannot go off the rails. There is no plan B. And we wonder sometimes at the the great awful conspiracy of the God of this world who has raged against you and caused the nations to rage against you. And surely he knows he is a defeated foe. Then in his murderous attempts to wipe out humanity and scrub the seed line from, from your memory, he has failed. In his attempts of genocidal atrocity to wipe out this promised nation of Israel, even bringing the seed line of Messiah down to one male in two successive generations. His murderous attempts against David, his murderous attempts against the son of David. And in his final short-lived victory at the cross, actually getting what he wanted. In your great sovereign irony, that is exactly the place of his defeat. And of your ultimate victory, that by the death of Messiah, even at the hands of Judas and Herod and a mob and the Roman Empire and of Satan himself, you got what you wanted. A sacrificial substitute to pay for the sins of everyone who would ever believe to rescue for yourself a humanity redeemed from the clutches of that awful conspiracy. And so we might sing that Satan's a really bad guy with a lot of power and a long history, but he fails because you win. Praise you, Jesus.